Well, I'm really excited to be here tonight. Um, and as Cassie told you, I'm a family practice doctor. And in the past few years, I've really developed an interest in sort of preventive health care, um, sort of this idea of how to keep people well. So that's why I decided to pick this topic tonight. Um, it's a pretty large topic. I cover a lot of stuff um, very briefly and sort of superficially. And um, I'm hoping in months to come to come back and maybe dive into some more details on certain topics. So you will find that there's a ton of information and probably too much information. But <laughs> um, if you bear with me by the end, hopefully you've learned a few things and, uh, and you know hopefully enjoy the talk. So preventive health care or the wellness visit. So our objectives today are going to be to identify modifiable risk factors for the most common diseases in our country, discuss appropriate screening tests and vaccinations, define the wellness visit or what lots of people sort of consider or I consider your annual physical, and, and also and most importantly empower patients like yourselves to make changes in regards to healthy lifestyle choices. So what is preventive health care? There's actually an entire fellowship and residency that you can do that focuses on preventive health care now because it's become so important in our country. But what it is, it consists of a measure taken for disease prevention as opposed to disease treatment. So as Benjamin Franklin said, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And I hope by the end of the presentation tonight that I have proven or at least answered the question, does an apple a day um, actually keep the doctor away? Okay. So this is a busy slide, so I'm going to kind of fly through it. But there's three types of prevention, and this is you know, important in regards to um, your overall health. So primary prevention includes actions taken to prevent diseases from developing. So examples would be smoking cessation to obviously decrease your risk of COPD or lung cancer. Um, eating healthy foods to reduce your risk of heart disease. Those are considered primary prevention. So secondary prevention, this det detects the disease once it has begun, but before it's clinically evident. So this is all your cancer screenings, okay? So it is um, getting your colonoscopy done so that we find a colon polyp and remove it, right, before you become symptomatic for it, from it. And then the last one is tertiary prevention, which is a little bit more just sort of what I do in my daily life. But um, this aim, aims to stop further complications once the disease has been um, clinically manifested. So it would be a diabetic patient who I counsel about healthy eating and exercise. So three types of prevention. So disease prevention. Uh, two thirds of all deaths per year in the US are caused by five chronic illnesses. And they are heart disease, cancer, stroke, COPD, and diabetes. And these are considered largely preventable through healthy lifestyle decisions about tobacco use, diet, and exercise. So we're going to talk about modifiable risk factors. And the most important ones that we're going to discuss are the top three here, tobacco use, an unhealthy diet, and physical inactivity. These account for approximately 33% of all deaths by themselves. And that's over 800,000 people per year. And, um, very interesting fact that in the last few years, obesity has ov actually overtaken tobacco as the leading cause of preventable death. So for many years it was smoking and now in our country it's obesity. So next is a really interesting slide that I hope you can kind of see. I first saw this slide probably 10 years ago in a presentation, um, you know, right after I graduated from residency. So in the top, this is the obesity rate in our country, 1990. So down at the bottom, uh, you know, Minnesota is less than 10% of our population was considered obese in 1990. So we'll just focus on Minnesota. In the year 2000, we're now dark blue, so we're in the 15 to 19 percentile. And by 2010, we're now in the yellow 20 to 24 percent. So with each passing decade, we're you know moving up in the wrong direction. Um, so much so that we keep adding new colors, right? Here's the initial one, and we keep having to add colors because a good portion of our southern states have an obesity rate of over 30 percent. And this does not include people who are overweight. This is obese, so this is people over a BMI of um, uh, of 30. But if you include people who are overweight as well, it's even higher. I don't expect you all to worry a whole lot about the cost of health care, but it is something from a societal perspective that we do have to worry about as our society is aging. And 75% of all health care dollars are spent on chronic disease management. And this over-reliance on treatment has created skyrocketing health care costs, which the na nation really can no longer sustain. 
And so hence this whole push to refocus um, our efforts as primary care physicians on prevention. Like how do we prevent disease until waiting until people develop diseases that we then need to treat, which are very expensive, right? The problem is at this point in our country, preventive services are not covered. You know, no one pays for me to spend time talking to you about the importance of smoking cessation, um, unless you're a Medicare agent, and then there's a slight, you know, there's a slight incentive to do it. Uh, no one pays for things like weight management anymore. No one pays for your nicotine replacement. So all these things that we really talk about prevention, unfortunately, health insurance companies haven't quite got on board with it. So, but we're hoping that there'll be significant changes in, in you know, in the time to come. All right, so another busy slide, but I just want you to kind of maybe read it with me and think about it as we go through the remainder of the lecture. So about 90% of middle-aged Americans will develop high blood pressure in their lifetime, and nearly 70% of those who have it now do not have it under control. And what we know is lowering your blood pressure level reduces your risk of death from coronary artery disease, stroke, and total cardiovascular risk. Regular screening for colorectal cancer can reduce the number of people who die of this disease by at least 30%. So if we do our job getting our patients screened for colon cancer, a mammogram every one to two years can reduce a woman's risk of dying of breast cancer by almost 16%. And for anyone who maybe has diabetes, a 1% reduction in your A1C, which is the average blood sugar over three months, um, reduces the risk of developing complications such as eye, kidney, and nerve disease by 40%. So we take someone with an A1C of 8.5 and we get them down to 7.5 through diet, exercise, lifestyle modifications, we're going to decrease their risk by 40% of developing complications. People who are obese or have a BMI greater than 30 have a 50 to 100% greater risk of premature, premature death from all causes than do people at a healthy weight. Within several months of quitting smoking, coughing, and other respiratory symptoms decrease and lung function improves. And after just one year, their risk for heart disease is reduced by half. And after 10 years, lung cancer death rate is also reduced in half. Diet and exercise changes that can lead to a 5 to 7% uh, body weight change, which is a very small you know, weight loss. Um, can uh, prevent or delay the onset of diabetes. And if you lose, ten, in one trial, there were people who lost 10 to 15 pounds and it reduced their risk of diabetes by 58%. Physical inactivity is a leading contributor to disease and disability, accounting for 22% of colon cancer, 18% of osteoporotic fractures, and 12% of diabetes and hypertension. All right, so that's a lot of, lot of statistics. So let's talk about the number one you know, disease in our country, heart disease. Cardiovascular disease is a leading cause of death of both men and women in the United States, and there are many modifiable risk factors that would decrease your risk. These include elevated cholesterol, hypertension, diabetes, obesity, smoking, and these account for over 50% of cardiovascular deaths. Okay, so there's some things we can't change about ourselves, right? So on the left are the things we can't change. We can't change our age, we can't change if we're male or female, sex, race, and family history. Those things are just what, what we've been dealt. But on the right-hand side, these are the things that you can do to decrease your risk of cardiovascular disease. And they include smoking, alcohol, poor diet, your weight, obesity, physical inactivity, high cholesterol, high blood pressure. So lots of things on the right that we can do. It's estimated that 80 to 90% of all heart disease is considered preventable. So there is this t uh, tool called the Framingham Risk Calculator, um, and some of your physicians may have done it in clinic with you. Hopefully they have at some point. Um, it is based on the Framingham Heart Study, which is the longest running multi-generational longitudinal study in medical history. So it's been going on for 70 years, I think. It identifies risk factors and their kind of influence on cardiovascular disease. And so essentially it gives you a number. What is your risk of having a heart attack in the next 10 years? So pretty, pretty helpful you know, statistic when we're talking to patients about trying to make positive changes. So this is kind of small. This is just a chart of the Framingham risk. Um, at the end of the lecture, I put a link that you can all go check what your Framingham risk is, and so it's super helpful for you. But you can see on this example, the person's 60 years old, so they get 10 points. Their HDL is low, which is not what we want, so it's less than 40. They get another two points. Their blood pressure is borderline, so they get three points. And then they have your cholesterol here. Because of their age and their total cholesterol being between 200 and 239, they get another two points. They're a non-smoker, thank goodness. They get zero points. So their total points are 17. They get a 5% 10-year risk. So you can see by just changing one thing, like you become a smoker, you've added two points to your score. It brings you to 19, and now you have an 8% risk. So, so let's talk about these individual risk factors that you can 
can change. Okay, so many patients come to me and say, we all, right? who has gone to the doctor and your doctor says you need to go exercise? And you leave and you're like, I have no idea what that means. Does that mean that I need to run a marathon next year? Should I go garden? Should I, what do I do? And so that has been a real struggle for years. And so the American Heart Association, as well as a few other groups came together and have sort of come up with this basic recommendation. And it's the one that's accepted by most organizations. So when we're talking about cardiovascular health or how to protect your heart, it's recommended that you have 30 minutes of moderate intensity aerobic exercise at least five days a week for a total of 150 minutes. Okay? Or if you want to exercise really hard, but just a little less time, you can do 25 minutes of vigorous activity three days a week for a total of 75 minutes. Okay? It's also important, as many people have been told, hopefully by their doctors, that as we age, to incorporate some sort of muscle strengthening activities into our exercise regimen, and that should be done at least two days per week. And that really provides other health benefits that we could talk about. Now, if your doctor tells you you have high blood pressure, you have high cholesterol, and then tells you to go exercise, now the recommendations have, are, are more. So it's not just 150 minutes anymore. Now we say we want you to do 40 minutes of moderate to vigorous intensity aerobic activity three to four times per week. So if you really want to have an impact on your hypertension or your cholesterol levels, you have to kind of up the intensity and up the duration, which isn't surprising. Same thing goes with if you want to lose weight, right? The top part is just what we all should be doing to stay healthy, regardless of our chronic illnesses. Okay, so physical activity, what is it? What should you do? Okay, pretty much it's anything that makes you move your body and burn calories. I like to tell people 150 minutes may seem like a lot to all of us, but the average movie, that's the length of an average movie. And I suspect that nearly everyone watches 30 minutes of TV per day. Um, whether that's news or something more pointless, we seem to be able to carve time out for that. And when people come to me and say, well, I don't have time to exercise, I tell them, right, look harder, because there's time in our days. We're all busy people, we have lots of, com lots of different time commitments, but we all can carve out 30 minutes five times a week, okay? So how do you find, you know, there's a variety of activities, and this, you know, I hope to have a totally separate lecture on exercise at some point, so I'm just kind of going over the basics here, but it's important to find an activity that is enjoyable and accessible for you, because that's going to make you, right, stay with it. So if you decide you want to be a runner, but you hate running and your knees hurt, and you live in cold Minnesota, then you're probably not going to keep up with that, and it's not going to be very helpful for you. Um, lots of studies to support group fitness or having some sort of workout buddy. Once again, if it's fun and it's enjoyable, people are laughing and people are smiling, you want to keep doing it. So walking is one of you know, the best activities for most people, particularly if they're just starting off with an exercise program. It's enjoyable, it's free, it's easy, it's social, it's flexible, you can do it anywhere, and therefore you have high success rates. All you need is a path, and we're lucky enough in Itasca County to have just tons of paved trails, a place like this to walk. Um, you need paved trails, a uh, pair of shoes, and that's about it, and maybe a friend to walk with. So my plug for Walk with the Doc, the second Thursday of every month, you can come walk with me for 45 minutes and breathe. <laughs> and it's actually been really fun. So, <laughs> so another thing that really can help people keep track of their activity level and really you know, encourage and give, give them some a little uh, more promotion is um, some sort of activity monitor, either Fitbits, which a lot of us wear, or something like a pedometer. The recommendation is to get to 10,000 steps per day. Um, if you're starting at 2,000 steps, you know, if you've you just got one and you're, you're looking down, you're like, gosh, I only had 2,000 steps today. Well, then we're not going to tell you to go to 10. Okay, we're going to go up in increments of 1 to 2,000. Um, but that should be the goal for everyone. All right, intensity of activity. So when we talk about moderate to vigorous, what does that mean, right? So light activity doesn't really count towards the guidelines when we talk about cardiovascular prevention. So light activity is going to be things like housework, shopping, laundry. Um, these things are great and certainly much better than sitting and doing nothing all day, and I don't want to discourage that, but when we talk about the benefits from a cardiovascular standpoint, you're not getting those by just living your life. Those things are considered activity to the daily living, right? We all have to do our laundry, we all have to shop, we all have to make, you know, make our meals. And it does count in regards to making you feel good and getting some movement, but as far as benefit, it's not there. So moderate activity is anything that's going to raise your heart rate, heart rate and essentially make you break a sweat. You should be able to talk when you're doing moderate activity, but apparently not sing is sort of the example. I <laughs> personally do not sing when I exercise, but I may try it at the next walk with the doc and see if I'm exercising <laughs> hard enough. <laughs> 
So that would include things like walking fast, water aerobics, pushing a lawnmower, biking on a level ground. So once again, all things that are very accessible to almost everyone. We all can probably find those things to do. Uh, vigorous activity is going to be something where you essentially can't talk. You're either running fast enough, you're swimming, ba playing basketball, tennis, something where you can maybe get out a few words, but you're not going to carry on a full conversation with your workout buddy. And obviously, there's ways to monitor your heart rate to determine this too, but that's way above this talk. Strength training, it needs to work all major muscle groups. You want to do one to two sets of eight to 12 um, reps, um, and once again, twice a week. And that can be lifting weights. It can be doing resistance bands, kettlebells, TRX. It can be doing sit-ups, push-ups, Pilates. Any of that stuff counts. But something um, should sort of target all the muscle groups, and you should do it two times per week. All right, here's the big slide. Doc, what do I eat to stay healthy? And I say, I have no idea. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Not really. <laughs> so the amount of information um, that's out there is overwhelming, right? It's overwhelming for me as a clinician who has actually a special interest in this. And it is absolutely overwhelming for a patient. Um, so there is no right diet for any particular person. Um, and I list kind of the ones that I think about in the community or the things that people talk about. So the DASH diet, something that we talk about, we use for hypertensive patients. My, pla my plate, which is, um, I'll kind of go over those slides in a little bit. Mediterranean diet, the paleo diet, the Mayo Clinic diet, and then we have all kind of the more commercial diets, Atkins, Weight Watchers, Jenny Craig, Metafest, Isogenics, blah, 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 blah. It goes on and on, okay? Once again, a whole separate topic, and Dr. Peel is going to address some of this in the next visit, but I'm just going to go over some basic stuff. You need to control your portion size, right? You need to eat more vegetables and fruit. You need to select whole grains. You need to limit unhealthy fats. You need to choose lean proteins. Uh, you need to limit your sodium intake to less than 2,000 milligrams per day. You need to eliminate sweetened beverages, which is a super easy thing to do and has a ton of calories, so really low-hanging fruit. We can all eliminate those and have huge benefit. Um, Best to plan ahead and create a menu because then we're going to typically have healthier meals um, versus, you know, grabbing a Diet Coke and a granola bar like I do sometimes in the morning, right? <laughs> um, and also allow yourself a treat. So it's not sustainable if we, like, eliminate one whole thing in our diet and say, I'm never going to eat this because that's unhealthy. It's not sustainable. At some point, you're going to eat it. Then you're going to feel bad, and then you're going to quit whatever healthy diet you were doing. So... So my plate is just one, I'm going to do just a couple slides on my plate. So um, essentially, we, we hand out plates at toddler visits now that actually a little plastic plate with divided, divided things to, to help parents teach their kids how to eat correctly. So essentially half of your plate should be fruits and vegetables. You should make at least half your grains whole grains. You should switch to things like fat-free or low-fat milk. Um, once again, enjoy your food, but eat less of it and avoid oversized portions. So you want to limit foods that are high in sodium. You can look at this picture. There's nothing good on that picture, right? I mean, it might taste good, but there's nothing good on there. <laughs> there are, everything's fried, everything's processed. Um, so we want to limit these foods. These are foods that are high in sodium and sugars and refined grains, and those should be special or sometimes foods. Not, we don't, everyone's going to want to eat french fries. I like french fries too, but they shouldn't be part of our daily diet. Okay, and we want to eat more of these wonderful things, more nutrient-dense foods. We have fruits and vegetables, beans, lean proteins, whole grains, all those things. Those are things we want to increase, right? I like this slide. I actually pulled it off someone else's, but, um, but it's really important because it's kind of just, once again, goes back to the basics of we want to enjoy our food. People get enjoyment out of food, and that's okay. In other parts of the world, people really enjoy food eating. They spend lots of time eating, but they're healthier than us. <laughs> and it's because they control their portions and they choose healthier options. So if you were to consume 100, or I'm sorry, decrease your calorie consumption by 100 calories per day, at the end of the year, you'd lose 10 pounds. So when I have a patient comes in and they're 200 pounds and I tell them they need to lose 10% of their body weight, I say, if you just eliminate 100 calories per day, You'd be down 20 pounds in two years, and you would be in a way better place. So it does not take drastic things to have an impact. So 100 calories a day is, uh, help me here. Uh, half of a Snickers bar. Half of a Snickers bar, OK. <laughs> All right, so cholesterol, another modifiable risk factor for heart disease, right? So I'm going to talk a little about cholesterol screening. All of, the t all of my slides on screening are based on the United States Preventive Task Force, okay? A huge group of people came together, and they decide on appropriate screening tests for children and adults, okay? There's some, some people don't support the United States Preventive Task Force. 
and we use some other recommendations, but in general, that's what I'm going to be talking about, okay? So they recommend uh, any male over the age of 35 or any male between 20 to 35 with increased cardiovascular risk. So let's say they have diabetes or they smoke. You should have your cholesterol screened every five years. If you're a woman over the age of 45 with increased risk of uh, cardiovascular disease, you should also be screened every five years. Now, there are lots of times we screen people more often for different reasons. Also, if you have borderline cholesterol, we're typically gonna repeat that in six months to a year, so there are, there are differences. It's important to know your numbers your guidelines on cholesterol treatment totally depend on other risk factors that you have, and that's something that really needs to be discussed with your individual um, physician. Here are the basic guidelines. Okay, best cholesterol, borderline, high or low. Okay, so total cholesterol, the best case scenario, we want it less than 200. You want your LDL less than 130. You want your HDL greater than 50 or 60. You want your triglycerides less than 150, okay? We'll go over to the other extreme. You would be considered high if your total cholesterol is greater than 140, if your LDL is above 160. If you're a woman, if your HDL is less than 50, not so good, less than 40, and a male, not so good. And if your triglycerides are 200, okay? So those are basic guidelines. The, the recommendation for statin use, which is the medications we use to lower cholesterol, um, have really become more conservative. So we're using statins less, um, and that's probably a good thing, but all right. Blood pressure guidelines, another modifiable risk factor, right? If you have high blood pressure and get it treated, you're going to decrease your risk of heart disease. Here are your guidelines. If you're less than 60, your blood pressure should be less than 140 over 90. If you're over 60, we actually tolerate a little bit higher blood pressure, and some of that is because of the risks of medication and dropping your blood pressure too low because you can get dizzy and fall, oh, we don't want that to happen. If you have diabetes, your recommendation is 140 over 90, and some, some associations will recommend less than 130 over 80. Aspirin use. So it's been in the news. You might see billboards all over the place about ask your doctor whether you should be taking aspirin. Um, what we know about aspirin is it does reduce your risk of your first cardiova cardiovascular event, uh, but there's inconclusive evidence on the death from heart disease or stroke. So it's not a gimme. 20 years ago, pretty much everyone was told to be on aspirin if you're over 55, and that's not the case anymore. You really have to balance the risks and benefits of it. Um, Low-risk adults, based on the Framing Framingham Risk Study, so once again, if you're less than 10%, you probably do not need an aspirin. If your Framingham Risk Score is greater than 10%, you're probably a good candidate for aspirin. If you're taking aspirin, it should be a baby aspirin, 81 milligrams. It does not need to be a full-dose aspirin unless your physician has told you you have a specific diagnosis that you require that, so it's a baby aspirin. Okay, so how do we decrease our risk of dying of heart disease, which is the number one killer of all of us, right? We exercise, we talked about that. Consume a healthy diet, make sure your blood pressure is under good control, uh, lower your cholesterol, improve, improve your blood sugar control if you're diabetic, aspirin use, once again, discuss with your provider. Alcohol, I wanted to throw that in there, and then stress modification. So once again, two really interesting topics could tie, you know, could tie up an entire lecture, but Good evidence to support that small to moderate amounts of alcohol do, do decrease your risk of cardiovascular disease, but no one has that as a recommendation. You're not gonna look up on the American Heart Association and have them tell you that you should drink four ounces of red wine every day, but there are lots of indi individual studies that do support that. Um, the problem is those, it's hard to take into account all the other factors that might contribute to someone who maybe drinks a glass of red wine. Maybe they also exercise and they eat lots of almonds, you know? So <laughs> it's, <laughs> that you, it's been really, you know, but it's obviously in the media and something I wanted to address. So if you like your red wine, you can have probably four ounces of it a day, but you know, we shouldn't have two or three glasses of it. Definitely then the risk totally outweighs any benefit. <laughs> <laughs> so very common to disease in our country, diabetes, right? 29 million people have diabetes. That means one out of 11 people, or 9% of the entire US population now has diabetes. That's 1.7 million new cases per year. And most shockingly, there's an increasing prevalence among youth. Um, it's jumped almost 30% since 2000, 2009. It's not unheard of to be diagnosing children under the age of 10 with diabetes. And this is not type one diabetes, I'm talking about type two. So I should clarify, this is type two diabetes. It's the seventh leading cause of death in our country. And it costs our nation $245 billion in costs in medical care costs and loss production and, uh, from patients. All right, so here's one of those fancy things again. All right, here we are, 1994, obesity rates, diabetes rates, okay? Yellow, we're in the yellow, we're white. We're less than 4% of the population had diabetes in Minnesota in 1994, and 14% of us were overweight, okay? See, we're overweight first, then we developed diabetes. 
here we go, 2004. We're at 22 to 25% obesity rate. And now our diabetes rate, because from 1994, uh, we're up to 45 to 5.9%. Here we go again. Anyways, you see the point, okay? <laughs> there's, a definite, there's a definite correlation between our increasing obesity rate and the development of diabetes, okay? It is a preventable disease. That's the whole gist of those screens, or those uh, slides. All right, so what increases your risk? Once again, stuff on the left, stuff we can't change, okay? Race, sex, age, family history. If you had gestational diabetes in pregnancy, it increases your risk. You can't really change that. Things that you can help. You can help your blood pressure. You can ha help your cholesterol, poor diet, overweight, obesity. Important to know that fat makes cells resistant to insulin. That's the correlation there. Physical inactivity, moving burns up glucose, right? So we use up our blood sugar by moving. So if you're inactive, you're not, losing, you're not using your sugar. And if you're overweight, your fat cells um, make you resistant to insulin, which is the normal way that our body makes our blood sugar go lower. So our we eat sugar, pancreas releases insulin, makes our blood sugar go lower and we're healthy, okay? The ADA has a website that you can go on um, and determine your risk of diabetes based on all these risk factors of developing diabetes. All right, diabetes screening. The United States Preventive Task Force recommends screening asymptomatic adults who have high blood pressure. They recommend screening all pregnant women, so we screen everyone at 25 to 28 weeks. And then there's a new recommendation that I suspect to be done by the end of the year that essentially says we should screen everyone who's at increased risk. Go figure, right? Um, but so that's going to be changing, and you may have that conversation um, with your provider. They may be um, screening you more aggressively because of the change in recommendations. Um, and this is important because we want to identify people early in the process when maybe they have impaired glucose tolerance um, because there's a span, you know, so if you're pre-diabetic, it may take five to ten years to develop diabetes and we want to know about that so that we can have an impact. All right, screening tests. There's four different ways to screen for diabetes. The first one is easy. It's, a, it's an A1C. Once again, it's your average blood sugar over three months. Um, that can be done non-fasting. It's considered normal if you're less than 5.7 can do a random blood sugar, so you're in for your knee pain and your doctor says we should check you for diabetes. They may do a random blood sugar. If it's less than 140, considered normal. If it's over 200, you're diabetic. Typically, we repeat that twice before we tell you that. Fasting glucose, less than 100 would be considered normal. 100 to 125 would be considered pre-diabetic. Um, and over 126 would be considered type 2 diabetes. And the last one, which is the least important, is uh, um, uh, oral glucose tolerance test, which we rarely do. So. I don't really do very often. So once again, numbers are you want your fasting blood sugar less than 100. Once you're above 126, it's not a good thing. So what happens if your doctor tells you you're pre-diabetic? Um, what do you do? We recommend modest weight loss, 5 to 10% of your body weight. Uh, moderate intensity activity, like we talked about, 30 minutes. Smoking cessation, enrollment in a diabetes prevention program. We have a great program here at the Y uh, that was here long before the YMCA clinic was here. It was run through a YMCA grant. They do a great job, so that's a great program. Um, and then there is some indication for using medications in even the pre-diabetic. All right. So let's talk about cancer, right? Sort of the dreaded thing, right? The thing we all fear. A half a million Americans die each year of cancer, and one in four of all deaths in the United States is from cancer. We estimate that 50% of cancers are considered preventable, once again. Um, and this is due to lifestyle and environmental risk factors. So those risk factors, would, or modifiable risk factors, include tobacco use, excess weight, poor diet, inactivity, and they account for over two-thirds of all cancers. So I want to just interrupt here and or just kind of interject that by no means am I telling people, who, all people who have cancer, that they could have prevented their cancer. So I certainly want to be sensitive to that because that is not the case, okay? But a good portion of them are considered preventable, and we can do things to at least decrease our risk of getting these types of cancers. So, all right, cancer statistics, the most common on the right, we have men. Uh, most common is prostate, followed by lung, colorectal. For women, it's breast, lung, colorectal the most deaths from cancer, so the, you know, the deadliest cancers. For men, it's going to be lung, prostate, colorectal, women, lung, breast, colorectal. So that is where all our screening recommendations come from, right, the most common ones. So modifiable risk factors for cancer. Tobacco. We estimate that it accounts for 30% of all cancer deaths. Obesity. We think it contributes to 20% of cancer deaths. Physical inactivity, 5%. Poor diet, particularly high fat. Alcohol consumption, 
apparently 42, maybe 42 ounces. No, I don't know. <laughs> um, there are certain infections um, that increase your risk of cancer, including uh, human papillomavirus, hepatitis C, um, HIV. And then, of course, environmental exposures that many of us um, cannot control and weren't aware that we were being exposed to. Um, and that would be including things like asbestos and Agent Orange. All right, let's talk about colon cancer. I think, here we go. 130 new cases and 50,000 deaths per year in the US. Incidence and mortality are steadily decreasing in the US, and this is because of screening. Um, we detect things earlier, we treat them, we have more effective treatment, people live. Um, we can save over 18,000 deaths per year if we screen properly. No one wants to have a colonoscopy. Anyone in this room want to have a colonoscopy? Anyone really excited to have it, right? All my patients, when I say, hey, it's time to have your colonoscopy, they're like, oh, I don't want to do it this year. It's, it's too embarrassing, and I don't like the prep. And, and I just say that, you know, to me, colon cancer is a preventable cancer. It is my job to convince you to have your colonoscopy. And if you don't have your colonoscopy and you get colon cancer, I consider that I've failed at my job because that is the whole purpose that you're coming to me is for me to keep you well. And if I cannot find a way to convince you to have a simple procedure, then I am not doing a very good job. So I would estimate that I have a probably 90% success rate in convincing people to have their colonoscopy. So if you haven't had one, you should come talk to me. Because <laughs> I'll even pull out scare tactics and I'll like <laughs> hand out candy bars, whatever, okay? <laughs> All right, so colon cancer prevention, what increases your risk? Um, lack of physical activity, consumption of red meat, obesity, tobacco use, alcohol use, age and male. Obviously, if you're a male, you're more at higher risk for colon cancer. You can't change it, can't change your age. Decreased risk, some good studies to support folic acid supplementation. Um, Anti-inflammatories and aspirin use, such as ibuprofen and Motrin, actually decrease your risk of colon cancer. Um, Postmenopausal hormone replacement therapy actually decreases your risk of colon cancer. So when the Women's Health Initiative came out many years ago, um, and we told all women, you know, all women came in and said, oh, I need to go off my, you know, Premarin because it, it causes breast cancer, and it does. It increases your risk of breast cancer, but it also decreases your risk of colon cancer, which is the second most common. So there you go, you know? It's that constant discussion with your provider, risk and benefit, okay? Um, calcium supplementation, uh, some good studies to support their uh, contributes to decreased risk. Um, obviously, healthy diet, statins, omega-3. I'm not gonna go into details about those things, but. Um, so colon cancer screening. Uh, US, uh, United States Preventive Task Force recommends screening all males and females between the ages of 50 and 75. Uh, if you have a family history, you should probably start at age 40. Uh, the basic recommendation is if you had a first degree relative that had colon cancer at the age of 52, you subtract 10 years, you should start having one at 42. Um, most people recommend stopping after the age of 75, but that's completely dependent on the health of a 75-year-old, okay? Because people are living longer and they're quite healthy at 75, and we probably would still recommend a colonoscopy at that age. But if they're obviously in a nursing home, we're not going to be doing colonoscopies on those people. So screening options, you can do fecal occult blood tests. So we send you home with those little cards, okay? Super easy. There's no reason anyone cannot do that every year, okay? You have a ball movement. You take a little stick. You take a little sample. You put it on the card. You close it up. You put it in an envelope, <coughs> and you mail it to us. And we find out if there's blood in there. If there's no blood, you're good for a year. If there's blood present, I'm going to call you and tell you you need a colonoscopy. Um, flex sigmoidoscopy, those for some of you that may have had them done in the past, a smaller scope, typically done while one is awake. Um, you do still need a, a slight prep with that. And they're becoming less popular as a screening recommendation just because many people don't do them. So when I was in family practice residency, we trained to do these, but then when I came out in practice, no one was doing them. So it's not, I mean, there are, you can consider that, particularly if you had like a redundant colon or your colonoscopy was quite difficult, but in general, not something we're doing around here a lot of. Uh, colonoscopy. The recommendation for colonoscopy is every 10 years, okay? Right? Once again, the prep is not fun. I'm not going to tell you it, it, it is. It's miserable, right? You have horrible liquid stools for a day. Um, the good thing is you're sedated during the procedure and you don't remember anything. So um, you do have to take a, you know, half a day to a day off of work, a day off work, um, which is inconvenient for some people and you need a driver. So it's not, you know, it's not possible for everyone to have a colonoscopy. I get that. But then we certainly can talk about one of the other two things. 
And then people are like, Doc, when are they going to come out with some other thing for colon cancer screening? You know, where I don't, it's so embarrassing to have that camera. And is there something else? What about a virtual colonoscopy? What about, there's fecal DNA testing, and there's all these things done at big academic centers, okay? We don't do that here. And it, it is a long ways away before we're going to have any of that available to us. Um, those are very expensive tests. Um, they, they ha I mean, people have to have special training. So once again, if you're lucky enough to live near Harvard or the Mayo, you can go have your virtual colonoscopy or your CT colonography, but here in Grand Itasca, we're going with the colonoscopy, okay? <laughs> and I actually had someone say, well, I'm just going to wait until you get that here. And I said, we would die by the time we, you know, it's <laughs> not a good idea. Why would you wait? <laughs> oh, okay. Cervical cancer becoming less common, right, because of screening. So women started having pap smears in the 70s. So we've seen a big, huge decreased uh, prevalence of cervical cancer. Another thing that's impacting cervical cancer is the HPV vaccine, okay? This is a vaccine. Um, HPV is the most common sexually transmitted disease. Um, if you get the vaccine, it protects you against 70% of the virus types that cause cervical cancer. So 90% of cervical cancer caused by the human papillomavirus, okay? So the vaccine prevents it 70% um, of the time, so why not get a vaccine that would decrease your risk of having cervical cancer? I mean, it seems sort of uh, like a no-brainer. Um, this is recommended for young women between, and men now between the ages of 11 and 26, all right? Um, the other thing you can do to decrease your risk of cervical cancer, don't smoke, limit the number of sexual partners, hence, if you limit the number of sexual partners, you're not going to get HPV, which means you're likely not going to get cervical cancer. Um, and then having your PAP or HPV testing uh, done, which we'll talk about next. Um, most cases of cervical cancer that I've seen in 14 years are due to the woman who has not had a pap smear in 15 years, right? She had one at 27, it was slightly abnormal, she got kind of freaked out by that, so decided not to come back, and now I see her at 45. So she's had no appropriate screening, and now she has cervical cancer. So what do we do for screening? We do a pap smear plus or minus the HPV test. It's recommended for women between the ages of 21 and 65. Um, if you're less than 21, um, you do not need a pap smear, okay? And the reason why is that most abnormal pap smears in someone less than 21 will go away without treatment. So the cervix, it has cells on it that regenerate constantly. So if at 19 you had an abnormal pap, if we just wait, it will go away. So we don't screen people anymore, even high-risk individuals at a young age. So we wait until they're 21. Um, and the problem was when we were screening people younger, and we were telling them they had abnormal PAPs, we were then doing treatment on them, such as cryotherapy or freezing or burning in the cervix, and that actually has a big impact on childbearing later in life. And so once again, we don't want to screen people that are under 21, there's no benefit to it. Um, once you're over the age of 65, if you've had three negative pap smears, you don't need one anymore. See how great it is? But you still need your colonoscopy. Um, so PAPs every three years, if you really don't like pap smears and you're like, I just want to prevent having these as, you know, as often as I can, um, you can go to every five years as long as we add a test called HPV. So we actually test for the virus, okay? So if the virus isn't there and your pap smear is normal, then you're good for five years. Um, the HPV testing um, we do here at Grand Itasca um, is covered by most insurance companies. So once again, if you're a woman who really hates them, ask your doctor to do that so you can extend it out to five years. Breast cancer. Uh, most common cancer, second most deaths. 12% of women will be diagnosed during their lifetime. There's 2.9 million women living with breast cancer in the United States. 89% five-year survival rate. So we have a very high survival rate of uh, breast cancer in our country. Um, and they, the, the rates have been uh, stable over the last 10 years. So we're not seeing some skyrocketing you know, cases. Okay, breast cancer screening recommendations. Controversial, right? You can turn on the news and everyone tells you something different. All right, so depending on the source we want to use, I'm going to go over the United States Preventive Task Force first. Um, they recommend a mammogram every two years in women ages 50 to 74. You can, you may begin screening earlier <laughs> um, if you ha are high risk, and they recommend stopping at the age of 75. The American Cancer Society, so really interesting. I did these slides eh, like 72 hours ago, and today they changed their recommendations. So, <laughs> so apparently all of you know that, so I don't need to tell you. Um, <laughs> but, but essentially, they, they previously were reckoning on annual mammograms and clinical breast exams annually at the age of 40 continuously, okay? Um, and now they've become more conservative, and so they've moved up more towards the United States Program Task Force. So starting at the age of 45 every two years. 
So I don't know. If you come see me, I'm probably, this is where I, like, I stray a little bit from the United States Permanent Task Force recommendations, pretty much screen everyone annually starting at the age of 40. And that is just like my professional experience of diagnosing many women in their mid-40s with uh, you know, stage three breast cancer. So I just hate to miss those people because it's such a, per it's such an, you know, if you catch it early, it's just so easy to treat. So, um, so this is where I fall off, you know, doing what I'm supposed to, I guess, but. Okay, what increases your risk of breast cancer? The things you cannot help on the left, okay. Sex, okay, more common in women, although if men get it, um, quite deadly. Um, age, as you get older, um, you're going to get, you know, you're in increased risk of breast cancer. Uh, race, uh, Caucasian, age of menstruation, age of first live birth, age of menopause, family history, particularly if you have BRCA um, gene mutation, number of previous breast biopsies, if you have dense breasts or if you've been diagnosed with DCIS. All those things increase your risk of breast cancer and there's nothing you can do about those ones. So things that you can help, you can breastfeed. So once again, another huge, you know, benefit of breastfeeding that I really try to talk to my young moms about. Um, you can change your diet, high fat diet associated with increased risk of breast cancer. Postmenopausal obesity, this is really interesting. So um, not so much if you're obese when you're 30 does it increase your risk of breast cancer, but if you're after menopause and you've gained, uh, you've gained weight or in that obese category, um, it does increase your risk. And that's because of the increased estrogen production. So fat cells produce estrogen, estrogen increases your risk of breast cancer. Physical inactivity, alcohol intake, obviously use of birth control or um, any estrogen, so any hormone will increase your risk. So what can you do to help prevent breast cancer? You can stay a healthy weight, especially after menopause. You can limit your alcohol intake. You can get regular exercise, eat a healthy diet, limit, to, uh, limit estrogen exposure, have your mammograms <laughs> every one to two years, sorry, every at the age of 40 to 50. Um, and then there's a breast cancer assessment tool that you can also use to determine your risk. So I always laugh because, you know, on that previous slide it talks about, you know, having babies older in life, blah, blah, blah. So essentially, if you have babies at a young age, you breastfeed them, and then you go through menopause uh, really early in life, you're, you're all set, then your risk is really low, but you can't really control those things. All right, skin cancer. So I'm just gonna briefly talk about skin cancer. It is actually officially, not even officially, off the record, it's considered the most common cancer, but it's difficult to have st the you know, appropriate statistics about it. Uh, but it's estimated that two to three million cases per year in the United States, most of those are going to be basal cell carcinomas. Um, what, you, what you can do to prevent your risk is limit your UV light exposure, either from sunlight or tanning beds. So in the 80s or 90s when I was in high school and everyone was going to tanning booths, so they would look tan when they were at prom, really bad idea. Um, and we don't see many people doing that anymore, but still in this community, I mean, what is there, two, three, four tanning booths, and there's still people going to them. It's shocking to me. Um, sunscreen, wide-brimmed hats, protective clothing now that has SPF protection built into it. Um, annual skin exams are not recommended unless you have a strong family history or personal history of skin cancer. Um, the majority of our lifetime sun exposure occurs in childhood, okay? So when someone comes in now and tells me, what do I do to decrease, you know, at 65 and says, what do I do to decrease my risk of skin cancer? Geez, you know, the ship kind of sailed. I mean, most of, <laughs> mo unfortunately, it doesn't mean I want you to lay out on aluminum foil and cover yourself <laughs> with baby oil, but, you know, it's kind of already done. So what you can do is if you have grandchildren, right? Get on them and their parents about using sunscreen, using the SPF shirts, um, limiting their exposure between the hours of 10 and 2. I mean, that is our best prevention, is really um, limiting that exposure in our little people. So um, if you have a family history of melanoma, um, recurrent basal cell carcinomas of the skin, you deserve an annual skin exam by a dermatologist, okay? And I really consider myself sort of having a special interest and in, I'm not gonna say expertise, but whatever, a special interest in, in, in skin cancer and skin. Um, but if I have a patient who has a mom or a dad who had melanoma, I just send them to dermatology. And the reason why is they have a much better way of photographing, monitoring those changing um, changing moles. I'm quite good at seeing a skin cancer when I examine it and I can, you know, I can biopsy and get you the right treatment, but it's those kind of subtle changes that I can't document. You know, so if I see someone and I look, I just have to try to memor you know, put it in my brain. I can't take a picture of it. I can't scan it into your chart. So I don't know if it's changing. So if you are one of those people that has a family history, you should be seeing a dermatologist every year. Lung cancer, the third most common cause of cancer, um, the leading cause of cancer, death. Smoking results in 85% of all lung cancers. Obviously, lung cancer has a poor prognosis. 90% of people will die of their lung cancer. 
Um, early stage non-small lung, uh, non cell lung cancer can be treated surgically and does have a better prognosis. So new screening recommendation, that's why I put it in here. In 2013, um, a recommendation came out to, be to screen for lung cancer. So if you're an adult between the ages of 55 and 80 and you have a history of smoking, at least a 30 pack your history and you still smoke. It's recommended that you have an annual low-dose CT scan. What does low-dose mean? It means low-dose radiation exposure. So once again, that risk benefit. Um, most insurance companies not covering this yet, in my experience. I mean, I've gotten a couple covered, but it's pretty difficult to get coverage for it. But it is recommended. And then you can stop screening those people when they've been a non-smoker for 15 years. Because remember the slide before, once you haven't smoked for 10 years, your risk goes down by half. So once again, if you've been a non-smoker for 15 years, regardless of your previous history, you don't need one. Osteoporosis screening, uh, United States Program Task Force recommends screening women only over the age of 65. So we used to screen people within four to five years of going through menopause. So sometimes I was screening people at the age of 52. Um, but right now the recommendation is greater than 65. You can go younger if you have increased risk. Um, there's something called the FRAX tool, which takes into consideration your age, your body mass index, whether you've had a parent with a fracture, uh, tobacco and alcohol use, and it spits out what's your risk of having an osteoporotic fracture. Um, and then we, you know, for younger people, then I'll, I'll order a bone density scan. How do you prevent osteoporosis? Um, calcium. We talked about it for whoever was at my walk with the doc a couple weeks ago. Calcium intake um, should be around 1,200 to 1,500 milligrams per day. Um, if you are on a proton pump inhi um, inhibitor, protonics, Prilosec, Zantac, renanidine, pri any of those medications that reduce your acid production in your stomach, you should make sure to be on calcium citrate. Okay, it's a type of calcium. So you want to make sure that you're taking the right amount of cal the right type of calcium <coughs> so that you absorb it. Vitamin D, once again, people probably have lots of opinions about vitamin D consumption. Um, the basic recommendation is 400 to 800 international units daily. Um, you should not exceed more than 4,000 international units daily. So these people that are trying to convince you to do super vitamins, really bad. It's fat-soluble vitamin. It's not good for your kidneys. So it is not the more, the better. There is a limit <laughs> th of betterness. Patients will hear on Dr. Oz or whatever that other doctor show is, and they say, they told me I should take 2,000. I'm like, fine, take 2,000 if you want to. But you should not go higher than that. It, there's just no benefit. Now, if you're a doctor and you have decided to check your vitamin D level and your level is low, Okay, less than 20 or less than 21, we'll put you on four or 5,000 for a while, short term, then try to wean you back down to 1,000 a day. So there, we do do that, but it's based on an actual vitamin D level. Most insurance companies do not cover us checking your vitamin D level. So it's a $300 test, and um, it's not covered by most insurance companies. So for the, in general, um, 400 to 800 units. In the winter, sometimes people like to increase it a little bit, right? Because you're not getting, um, not getting the sun exposure that you, we would if we live somewhere warm and sunny. Fall prevention. Um, I put this in here because there is a strong recommendation that if you're over the age of 62 and you're living in your own home, that you should be on vitamin D supplementation and it actually prevents falls. So there you have it. That's all I'm going to talk about with that. Um, the other thing to know about calcium and vitamin D is it improves bone density, but the evidence is unclear as to whether it actually reduces your risk of fracture. So, um, and, and you probably have seen that in the news as well. But these are, you know, these are, are, are easy things with minimal risk as long as you keep them at the appropriate dosages. Weight-bearing exercise, every time you stomp and walk, uh, your osteoclasts tell your, tell your bones to build more, more bones. You know, so it's good. That's why actually the one thing, if you're overweight, um, it actually decreases your risk of osteoporosis because every time you step, there's more pressure on those osteoclasts and they, they uh, produce you know, more bone growth. So limit caffeine and alcohol intake, quit smoking. Bisphosphonates, um, once again, a whole separate lecture, but you know, your doctor and you can talk about whether or not you'd be a good candidate for Fosamax or other medications like that to help improve your bone density. Vaccines, okay, here we go. I'm going to preface this why, by I'm giving you the information, but I do not want to argue with you about whether or not they're safe, <laughs> okay? My, my feeling is vaccinations are safe. Some people may not feel that way, but I, as a medical professional, based on years and years and years and years of data, feel that vaccines are safe, and they save lives, and they, um, so there you go, okay? All right. <laughs> Influenza, annually. Okay, last year's influenza vaccine, horrible, right? It was like 20% effective, and so now this year trying to convince people to get their flu shot, they're like, no way, it didn't work last year. Okay, it might not have prevented you from getting influenza, but it certainly decreased the, the severity of your illness. So 
it wasn't a great year. I'm hoping this year is better. Uh, but still a strong recommendation. I certainly give my family influenza vaccines. Um, I get mine every year. I make my kids get them. It's a way of life. And we all had influenza last year. Doesn't mean I'm not, doesn't mean I'm not gonna make my kids get them this year again. Okay? <laughs> pneumococcal vaccine or pneumonia vaccine. So once again, new recommendation. If you're over the age of 65, you should have pneumonia vaccines. If you're less than 65 with chronic disease, diabetes, COPD, heart disease, you also qualify for a pneumonia vaccine. Um, it decreased, the pneumonia vaccines actually decrease the risk of getting invasive pneumococcal disease by over 50%. So it has a significant um, impact on health. It's not going to prevent you from getting pneumonia, okay? It's, it, it's, it's decreasing the risk of you getting really bad pneumonia, like an invasive process where it's in your bloodstream and you get really sick and need to be intubated and put in an ICU, okay? That's what we're trying to avoid. Um, you get it once after the age of 65, and that's it, okay? If you're a splenectomy patient or something like that, the recommendation is different. So it is just a one-time shot unless you have certain um, diseases. So, but there's two pneumonia shots now. So many of you um, may have already gotten your pneumovax. That was recommended for many years. But last year, two years ago, I think, I'm trying to think, sometime in the last year, uh, the Prevnar vaccine came out and is, all, er, is now recommended for adults in that age group. So if you've gotten your pneumovax, ask your doctor about Prevnar, which is the second pneumonia shot, okay? They have to be split up by six to 12 months. So that's more details for your doctor. Shingles vaccine, one million cases of shingles per year, right? If you ever had shingles, it's horrible, um, not fun. Um, the Zosavax vaccine, vaccine is available, recommended for anyone over the age of 60, okay? Once again, it's not gonna eliminate your risk of completely of getting shingles, but if you get shingles, it's gonna be less miserable. So, and easy shot, uh, costs, you know, $300, not always covered by insurance. So that's kind of a, the bad thing about the shingles vaccine. Okay, another important uh, vaccine, tetanus, uh, the Tdap, or tetanus pertussis. So tetanus shot, right? Step on a rusty nail, get tetanus. You're supposed to get that vaccine every 10 years, okay? The Tdap is different. It has pertussis, or whooping cough vaccine, in it as well. So hopefully we all got vaccinated against whooping cough as children. What we realize is as we age, we lost that immunity, and we as adults tend to be the person that's now spreading whooping cough around the country. So now it's really important that we get that booster. So it's recommended between the ages of 19 and 64. So one time, Tdap between that time. And then again, over the age of 65, if you have close contact with infants. So if you're a grandparent, um, you should be checking with your doctor to find out if your Tdap is up to date. Not your tetanus, your Tdap, okay? Because you need the pertussis part. Hepatitis B series, recommended for at-risk adults. So diabetics, diabetics should have hepatitis B vaccine. I'm finding many of, you know, even my own, um, because of my oversight, have not had their hepatitis B vaccine. The annual physical, okay? So women get an annual physical almost every year. Most women do. Men, not so much. Because an annual physical started because of a pap smear, right? We are supposed to come in every year to get our pap smear, a preventive service. What has happened over time, health insurance premiums increase, people are spending a lot of money to have their health insurance, they're short on time, they're short on money, and they wanna come in once a year, they wanna get everything done, okay? I'm here to see you, doctor, for all my cancer screenings, my hypertension management, I wanna talk about my knee pain, my rash, my depression, my <laughs> hair loss, and I, I'm like overwhelmed, right? My head is spinning. I don't even remember the patient's name. I don't remember <laughs> anything about them because I am overwhelmed with the list, okay? Shows like Dr. Oz and Oprah Winfrey, they have done great things because they're empowering people to be an advocate for their health care. And I I, that's great, okay? I absolutely support that. We have more medical information at our fingertips now, right? Every one of you can go home tonight, and you can Google anything I said, and you can either you know, come back and tell me I'm a liar or I'm telling the <laughs> truth, okay? Another thing that makes our job really difficult. <laughs> but the list, they're so overwhelming as a medical provider. Um, and they do you no good. I mean, they really, and are potentially detrimental to your health, okay? If you're lucky enough that you have an insurance plan that covers an annual physical or a wellness exam, like Medicare wellness, annual wellness exams, look at this as a time to focus on prevention, okay? not disease management or acute issues. So I have been talking for a long time, apparently 45 minutes or more, if you come to me for your preventive wellness exam, I want to spend 40 minutes talking to you about everything I just talked to you about, okay? I don't have time 
to talk to you about your rash and your hypertension and your knee pain and everything. I can't. It's not possible. So something has to give. You know, so what unfortunately happens to many of us is we don't talk about prevention because we're dealing with what the patient wants, which is, I want you to look at my knee, I want you to look at my rash, and I respect that, but then I don't have time to talk to you about the rest of it. And then I feel like I'm not doing my job as a primary care physician, because that is my job, is to try to prevent illness and keep you well. So during that time, we want to talk about appropriate screening exams. We want to discuss all those modifiable risk factors, right? I love talking to people about weight loss and diet and exercise, and I mean, I, I'll spend, 30 minutes just talking, you know, talking to you about those things. We want to update immunizations during that appointment. Once again, really important because you want to know risk benefits of immunizations. You know, you want to talk to me about that. You don't want me to just say, ah, you need this and this and go on your merry way, right? You want to talk to me about that. Um, it's a time to discuss supplements. Everyone has questions about supplements. That discussion takes five to 10 minutes. And I would love to have the discussion with you, but I can't do it with all that other stuff too. Um, we also take that as a time to talk about depression uh, safety and abuse screenings, all super important stuff, okay? I always tell people when you come see me for your annual physical, it's kind of like it's my time to discuss how to keep you healthy. Um, and it's really tricky because patients, they want every, they're, they're busy, they want us to deal with everything at once. And I, 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 I get that and I, I'm busy too, and you know, when I go to the you know, doctor, which is like almost never, I mean, I'd like to get the most, you know, <laughs> I'd like to get the most bang for my buck, right? We're all paying this exorbitant amount, but what I'd ask people is like, come to me for your annual physical and let me talk to you about all these really important things. Um, and if you have other issues, I will get you in in a week, or two weeks, or three weeks. I will fit you in, come back and talk to me about three or four other things on your list, and then come back and see me two weeks later and we can talk about the other two. But you know, do yourself a favor, and, and your physician. And when you are coming in for these exams, um, just take a time to listen to what your doctor has to tell you or say to your doctor, I'm here today because I wanna talk about ways to keep me healthy. Tell me how I, how I stay healthy, how do I stay well? And see, hopefully your doctor can share all this information with you, okay? If they don't, pull out your list and start talking about all the other stuff, okay? <laughs> 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 all right. So apps to keep you healthy, if you have a smartphone, um, there is this very long app that I, the top one, that's the United States Preventive Task Force. You plug in your sex, your age, whether you smoke, and it spits out all the health screenings you should have done. So kind of a cool app. Um, the CV Risk Assess is a Framingham Risk Factor, once again, an app you can put on your phone. Um, My Fitness Pal, Lose It, any of those um, programs that help you track your activity or caloric intake, super helpful, you know? So I encourage you if you have those things or have a smartphone to, um, to put those apps on there. And a Fitbit or pedometer, also another great thing. Okay, conclusion. Here we are. So there are many factors that we can't control in regards to our health, right? So we want to take control of the ones that we can impact. What I want you guys to do is leave here feeling empowered to make some healthy changes in your life. And it can be something super simple. Like every night I'm gonna walk for 10 minutes, or I am not going to have sweetened beverages anymore, or I'm gonna talk to my doctor about aspirin, or I'm gonna go get my Prevnar shot. I don't care, but leave tonight with at least one goal that you can you know, talk to your doctor at your next appointment. So don't smoke, exercise 150 minutes per week, plus weightlifting. You wanna maintain an ideal body weight. You wanna limit your alcohol consumption, manage stress, get enough sleep. Don't ask me how to do those things because I'm not very good about those. <laughs> Schedule appropriate cancer screenings. You want to update your vaccines, uh, calcium and vitamin D supplements, as we talked about. Discuss aspirin use with your doctor. Wear your seatbelt, wear sunscreen, eat a healthy diet, right? Don't be a passive bystander in regards to your health. Take responsibility, make some positive healthy changes. Final thoughts. I love this guy, right? The reality is the average life expectancy is getting close to 80, okay? We live a long time. If I had known I was going to live so long, I would have taken better care of myself. Okay. And it's so true, right? I mean, all of these things, I hope that all of you live to be 80, you know, um, and making these choices now to exercise and eat right will make your life so much more enjoyable when you're 80. So that's it. Thank you.